the microphone works much better when I turn it on. It's sort of like prayer if you never make the connection. Good morning and Happy New Year. I'm Dan Jackson. I'm one of the pastors here at Purple Door Church. Welcome to worship. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we would invite you to stop by the counter out in the cafe area. Uh, we've got a gift for you there, and we'd really just like to get to know you better. Um, speaking of that, there is a new member class coming up on February 5th at 1230. Uh, so if you've been thinking about uh, becoming a part of this faith community, we'd love to talk with you about joining. Uh, so please give a, give a call to the church office uh, if that's of interest to you. Also, if uh, you look around uh, at one of these beautiful poinsettias and say, I wonder which one is mine, uh, if one of these is yours, if you'd uh, pick it up and uh, take it home so that we'll be doing some uh, new decorating in the week ahead. So let us now uh, unite our hearts and prepare to worship our God.
and we'll turn to page 848 for a responsive reading in the 130th Psalm. Out of depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. If you, O Lord, should mark inequities, Lord, who could stand? I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. In the Lord's word, I hope. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, for the Lord is plenteous redemption. And the Lord will be in Israel. Remind us that life is lived into the future. We need your sense of the future. Teach us to know that life is ever on the side of the future. Keep alive in us the future look, the high hope. Let me not be frozen either by the past or by the present. Grant me, O patient one, your sense of the future without which all life would sicken and die. O God, grant us forgiveness for the times in the past year when we have walked away from you, that we might enter into the new year, released to live life in the fullness of your grace. God of all our lives, you have formed us as a people and claimed us as your own. As we come to acknowledge your sovereignty and your grace, and to renew our covenant with you, reveal any reluctance or falseness within us. Bring your peace to any friends with lives in turmoil. Your healing where there is pain. Your presence where grief binds us to the past. Let your spirit impress your truth on our inmost being and receive us in mercy for the sake of our mediator, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you. As the ushers prepare to wait upon you for a morning tithes and offerings. To the end of the year, beginning of the new year, is a time when you sort of take stock of what's happened over the past year. And I am just in awe of what this church does in ministry for the thousands of lives that were touched this past year because of the ministries of this church. 
So I'd invite you to remember all of those ministries as the ushers wait upon you for our tithes and offerings.
Oh Lord, help us not to focus on materialistic gifts we receive that bring only monetary happiness. Help us to recognize the good gifts we have already received, embracing an attitude of gratitude and generosity. Let us choose miracles over materialism, both receiving them and sharing them with others. May our spirit be an infectious one that draws others to you. With so much gratitude, amen. You may be seated. Forgive their iniquity, 
and remember their sin no more. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now if you remain uh, seated, we will sing our next hymn, number 382, Have I No Way, Lord. The church that I served in Florida was located in an area called the Villages. The Villages, if you're familiar with it, is really one of the golfing capitals of the country. They boast that there are over 1,300 holes of golf on 57 courses there. There is golf everywhere. Well, in the late 1990s, when the church was first being uh, organized and planned, they were struggling to come up with a name for the church. And one of the suggestions was to make, name it Mulligan United Methodist Church. <laughs> if you think about this text and what Jeremiah is saying, then the eventual name of the church really does make sense. Because the church became New Covenant United Methodist Church. The new covenant that God is offering God's people here is kind of a divine mulligan, if you will. It's a, it's a do-over for God's people. Now this is a, 
this is a difficult time in the history of the Israelite people. Judah, which is the southern of the two kingdoms of Israel. Judah was the southern kingdom, Israel was the northern kingdom. And it's Judah in the southern kingdom where Jerusalem is located. And for years and years and years, Judah had served as kind of a, a buffer between Babylon and Egypt. And so the political leaders of Judah would constantly be negotiating with either the Babylonians or the Egyptians to see who would offer them the best deal on and protecting them. This offended God. If you read in many of the, the prophetic literature, read, read many of the prophets, they talk in there about how God decries foreign alliances. And Jeremiah elsewhere talks about who have you not sold yourself to? in protesting what the governments have done. Because God had said to the people, I'll take care of you. You don't need to be making these other entanglements. You will hear tones of that in the psalm that we read responsibly earlier today. Well, these two countries, Babylon and Egypt, are constantly in this negotiation. Babylon has finally had. And Babylon says, we're just going to consolidate and we're going to take over Judah. So they come into Judah, their armies overrun Judah. They eventually surround Jerusalem, enter into a siege of Jerusalem, and finally destroy the city and destroy Solomon's holy temple, the great temple that was in Jerusalem at that time. Well, it's difficult for the people to figure out what's going on here because their belief was Okay, we're God's chosen people, and God has said God will protect us. And yet here comes this foreign army overrunning us. And we believe that God actually is so united with us that God has chosen to live in the temple. They believe that the temple was God's actual residence. So the armies overrun the country, the temple gets destroyed. What does this all mean? Well, if you, as you listen to the, to the passage being read, one of the key lines in there is my covenant, which they have broken. In other words, God is saying to the people, you broke the covenant that I made with you, one based on the law. And where I said, you, you will live out the law, you will live as I tell you to live, and I'll protect you. But God says in this passage, no, you, you broke that. And you can pick up pretty specific terminology elsewhere amongst uh, the other prophets about how the people broke the covenant. And primarily it has to do with them being hard-hearted, about them not welcoming strangers, about them not caring for the poor, about them not caring for widows and orphans, and not dealing fairly with one another. So what God is, is saying in this passage is, for a little while, things are gonna be kind of tough for you. And in fact, they were because the Babylonians not only overran the country, they took the leadership of the country and many others back to Babylon with them to serve as servants over a long, long period of time. So God says to them, in a little while, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. It's sort of like God is saying to them, you're going to go through a divine timeout period here. Where we're going to kind of set you over here. And when I make this new covenant with you, it's going to be different. Because this new covenant is going to be written on your hearts. It's going to be so much within you that you will just instinctively act the way I want you to act. That you will begin to care for others the way that I want you to care. You know what the Israelites went through? It's not so different 
and what all of us go through. Because human nature is what human nature is. And for us as humans, we want to be faithful. We want to be known as God's faithful people, and yet there's that part of us that kind of wants to define faithfulness our way, not always God's way. That was the problem for the Israelites. They wanted to define their faithfulness their way. God had set out very specific rules. God's criticism of them shows up in multiple places in prophetic literature. Specifically, when God tells the people, I desire mercy, not sacrifices. And in Micah, when God says to the people, what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So God had told them over and over again through the prophets until finally God said, this is what's going to happen to you. But there will be a new covenant. Now the new covenant has some remarkable areas in it. One is that God expresses a unique solidarity with God's people. God says to the Israelite people, just as he says to us, I am with you. In fact, I want to be so close to you that I want to write what I want you to do on your very hearts. Now, this becomes even clearer to us when God sends Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. God wants to be one with us united with us in a special way. God also says in, through the prophet Jeremiah that during this time there will be full knowledge of who God is. And because you will have this full knowledge of God within you, this full knowledge of God's grace and love and strength and power, that you will just instinctively, automatically, Obey God's commands for justice and for mercy. Now included in this is a subtle reminder that God already cared for the people by carrying them out of the Exodus, bringing them out of Egypt in the Exodus. So that God has shown that God will protect the people. Where in our lives? Where in your life can you think of times God has brought you out of danger, that God has cared for you, that God has given you the strength to get through something that when you look back on it, you aren't even sure how you could get through it. For the Israelite people, that was the memory of the Exodus. For us, it might be the difficult times we've all experienced. And in this passage, God also says that the least and the greatest will have this new covenant. God is saying it doesn't make any difference who you are. doesn't make any difference how poor you are or how rich you are, how powerless or powerful you are. This is available to everyone. And all of this, all of this is possible because God has chosen to forgive you. Because God has chosen to forgive us, all of us, all of humanity, every one of us, should stand in grateful awe before the miracle of forgiveness. God ends with these wonderful words, and I will remember their sin no more. What a gift that is to us. The writer Max Lucado has a, a great little conversation he uses in one of his devotionals about him talking with God and God answering him. And he starts off his prayer by saying, God, you remember that time that I, and God interrupts him and says, no, Max, I, I don't remember. 
I will remember your sin no more. A gift. This idea of being in covenant is something that was essential to John Wesley and the early Methodists. They believed that the idea to, of being in covenant required them to be in arrangements that made sure there was accountability in their lives, that made certain that there were ways that they continued to be strong in the covenant, that God's word very much got written on their hearts. Wesley expressed it in a term he called holiness of hands and heart. And what he meant by that is, the closer we draw to God, the more holy we get in our hearts. Then the more we will be motivated, the more we will want to reach out in love and concern and service to all the world. Now, to help his people do that, Wesley in his early societies, in England, and that idea then came to America, where that the people would be in covenant with one another in multiple ways. So the first of these was something he called the class meetings. Class meetings for Wesley was a group of six to 12 people. <clears throat> Excuse me, never more than 12. But these people would gather at least weekly. They would gather confidentially but they would gather to help one another change their behaviors. That meant that they would support one another, challenge one another on whether or not they were studying scripture or not. Challenge them on their prayer lives. It was not a time for teaching, but rather a time to hold one another accountable and to change behavior over time so that people would be more involved with prayer and Bible study now, each of these class, each of these cell groups, these, these class meetings, were interconnected with a greater society, which was kind of the umbrella group. The societies would gather once or twice a month for what you think of now as, as worship, but it was a time of teaching. You read Wesley's sermons given at those times. They are very intellectual uh, in, in their organization and in their arrangement. The idea was to teach, so that you could help people renew their minds while you were working to help people be held accountable and to change behaviors. <coughs> Wesley believed that there was no spiritual growth without accountability. And he also had other groups. Each leader not only led a group, but was in a group where they were challenged and held accountable. Then there were two other groups one was called the penitent bands. That was for the people that had backslid so that they had been ejected from a group. But they could go to the penitent band, receive grace and forgiveness and nurture back into the community. And then there was the select society. <clears throat> and the select society, excuse me. was where the leaders of the groups <clears throat> would gather. Well, even with all of this, Wesley thought it was necessary once a year for the people to renew their covenant and re renew their commitment to God and to one another. This practice began in 1755 and became a popular part of Methodism. Wesley himself said uh, that many people were brought before God, many were comforted, and many deepened their relationship with God through this annual renewal of their covenant. Charles Wesley even wrote a hymn just for that service. Uh, the hymn is called, Let Us Use the Grace Divine. The covenant service was a very significant part of the Methodist life through the 17 and 1800s and even into the early 1900s, and then began to fade a bit. But over the past 15 to 20 years, it's something that has gained uh, in new popularity, and we offer it today and invite you to join it as a way uh, to increase your own faith. So I would invite you to join now in the covenant prayer. <laughs> Righteous God, 
For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, see me as I submit myself to you. Forgive my unfaithfulness in not having done your will. For you have promised mercy to me if I turn to you with my whole heart. God requires that you shall put away everything that draws you away from God. I hear from the bottom of my heart, renounce all that leads me away from you, covenanting with you that no known sin shall be allowed in my life. Against your will, I have turned my love toward the world. In your power, I will watch all temptations that will lead me away from you. For my own righteousness is riddled with sin, unable to stand before you. Through Christ, God has offered to be your God again, if you would let God order your life. Before all heaven and earth, I here acknowledge you as my Lord and God, and vow to give up myself, body and soul, as your servant, to serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of my life. Through Christ, God has opened access to God's infinite grace. Jesus, I do here on bended knee accept Christ as the only new and living way, and sincerely join myself in a covenant with him. I do here with all my powers accept you as my Lord and leader. Through your grace, I promise that neither life nor death nor anything else in all creation shall separate me from you. Let us pray together. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you, or laid aside by you. Praise for you, or humble for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine, and I am yours, so be it. Let the covenant I have made on earth be ratified in heaven. Amen. It was out of this covenant based on the grace that God offers to each and every one of us, based on the forgiveness that God offers to everyone, that Wesley's own theology developed into what we as United Methodists today call the means of grace. That is the sacraments of Holy Communion and Baptism. It is also why we invite everyone to join in this time. No matter what tradition you come from, you are welcome, you are encouraged here to receive Holy Communion, or you'll tear, tear off a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us. But all are welcome to receive. If you require it, there is gluten-free elements here on the table to my left, to your right. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he gathered with his friends, took bread, broke it, blessed it, gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body given. When the meal was nearly ended, he took the cup, blessed it, gave thanks to God for the wine and for all of the goodness of life. 
and gave it to his friends and said, Take, drink. This is my blood poured out for you and the world. The blood of the new covenant. The blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Do this when you gather in remembrance of me. Oh God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on those of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may rise from this time prepared to be one with you, Jesus Christ, one with the world, and one in concern and ministry to all of them. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Invite those who are serving to come forward.
Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this holiest of mysteries in which we are united with our Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for the holiness and yet the power of this mystery and of your grace. We give thanks and ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, if you'll stand and join me in the singing of our closing hymn, number 383. This is the day of new beginnings. We will be singing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. 